If you look at revolts, insurrections, revolutions, there have been more insurrections about debt, I would hazard to guess, than any other single issue in human history. Slavery, serfdom, feudal arrangements, caste arrangements, any form of inequality you want to name. Um, you know, people occasionally revolt, but with debt they revolt regularly. What is a debt, after all? It's a contract between two equal parties not to be equal anymore until one of them pays the money back. But it implies that you could be equal. And that is actually, I suspect, part of the reason it can become so explosive. It's a long way from the fall of the Roman Empire to Europe after the 2008 economic crash. However, the issue of debt is as important now as it was then. And how society deals with it takes us back to Karl Polanyi. Plusieurs études révèlent une augmentation des dépressions et suicides en Grèce où la crise économique et sociale paupérise des pans entiers de la On the 4th of April 2012, a 77-year-old retired pharmacist shot himself to death as a protest against the cuts in his pension. The cuts were part of the severe austerity that Greece was forced to accept in exchange for more loans intended to help it avoid bankruptcy. The Archie Lipon ξεκινάει με ένα τέλος. Ε, αυτό έστειλε μου στη λοπατέρας μου την τετάρτη το πρωί στις 8:30 ώρα στο κινητό μου τηλέφωνο. Τέλος. Αυτό ήταν το το μήνυμά του. Ε, αμέσως κινητοποιήθηκα τον πήρα τηλέφωνο τόσο στο κινητό όσο και στο σταθερό στο σπίτι, δεν μπόρεσα να τον βρω. Κατέβηκα στους αμπελοκήπους, στο σπίτι του, μπήκα μέσα και είδα το ιδιόχειρο σημείωμά του. Επειδή έχω μια ηλικία που δεν μου δίνει την ατομική δυνατότητα δυναμικής αντίδρασης. Δεν βρίσκω άλλη λύση από ένα αξιοπρεπές τέλος πριν αρχίσω να ψάχνω στα σκουπίδια για τη διατροφή μου. Uh, we are facing an economic disaster. We have an official unemployment rate of 22%, which means that the real unemployment rate uh, must be around 30%. We are at the brink of a humane catastrophe. At this time that we are speaking, there are at least 20,000 people seeking food and other necessary things in the garbage. When it was insisted that Greece honor its commitment, an economic crisis developed into a social and political one. Democracy was always a very insecure, imperfect and precarious system. But never before has democracy been at such a peril as it is now. I come from a country, from Greece, where the political elites have disappeared. They have lost all legitimacy. It's not just that the government has lost legitimacy. Every single political movement has lost legitimacy. And this is a major, major turnaround for a country in which democracy was born. The only beneficiaries are the Nazis because the serpent's egg hatches in this environment of bankruptocracy and loss of hope. The 
Γιατί ο κόσμο πεινάει, δεν έχει δουλειέ. Έχουμε και εμεί την αυτομετανάστε. Κατάλαβε τι γίνεται. Πρέπει να φύγουν όλοι από εδώ πέρα. Ή με το καλό ή με το κακό. Και θα φύγουν. Να είσαι σίγουρη γι' αυτό. So with such a social and economic price to be paid, why was bankrupt Greece forced to continue to pay its debt? Is this strange moral power that debt has over us? It can seem to justify anything. What is it about debt that seems to trump any other morality? The more I research the matter, I realize that this kind of moral confusion, this moral conflict over debt, goes back thousands of years. People have been having these kind of arguments forever. And I think the reason why is because, well, what is a debt? A debt's a promise. But in a way, it's a, it's a very weird kind of promise. I, I even say it's a perversion of a promise. Because it's a promise that has been suffused with this kind of combination of mathematics and violence. This is the true shocking story of Scarface Al Capone who stalked out of Chicago to take America by the throat. This is why the Mafia, for example, always tries to turn everything into a debt when they're collecting it, to moralize it. The fact that it is a promise makes it seem sacred in a way that other relations of, well, to put it frankly, extortion don't. And in fact, if you look at history, what you find is that debt is the most effective means ever created to take what is essentially a relationship of violent extortion and make it seem moral. And not only to make it seem moral, to make it seem like it's actually the victims who are somehow morally to blame. Let's talk about a person. This person could be anyone. Let's call him Alex. Let's make things more complicated. Let's say Alex is Greek. Based on the stories you hear, Alex is also a lazy, cheating, ungrateful, helpless, corrupt, violent, rude, racist, tax evading, troublemaking, thieving vandal that lives with his mother. Well, the stories say it. So it must be true. That's are always negotiable if they are between equals. People who you consider equal in status, of course debts can be renegotiated. In fact, what we saw in 2008 is if you're American Insurance Group, if you're Bank of America, if you're Citibank, you know, they're willing to write off trillions of dollars worth of debt by waving magic wands of one sort or another. Um, they have no problem forgiving debt. So, you know, how is it that American Insurance Group can have their debts written off and Greece can't? Clap on, clap on, clap on, clap on. The Clapper lets you turn capitalism on or off however you choose. Don't trouble yourself with a complicated socialist revolution. Just clap on, clap off. Clap on when times are good and you make the profit. Clap off when times are bad. Just clap off the free market and the glorious state will provide. The only possible explanation is that people assume that the kind of people who are in American Insurance Group are people like them. And in fact, if you look at world history, what you realize is that debts between equals are fundamentally different than debts between the powerful and the powerless. So what had happened? When did debt become a supposedly purely economic issue? When did the economy surpass social relationships? According to Karl Polanyi, it was the reorganization of society during the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century. When for the first time in history, labor, land and money were transformed into commodities. But labor, land, and money, he wrote, are obviously not commodities. Labor is only another name for human activity, which goes with life itself. 
le marché a sa propre logique s'il a des biens tout à fait spécifiques, normaux, liés par l'échange. Mais la société rentre en risque lorsque le travail lui-même devient une marchandise. L'argument polanien, si on transforme complètement le travail en une marchandise, la société risque de s'effondrer sur elle-même. Deuxième intuition polanienne, la monnaie. Money is merely a token of purchasing power, Karl Polanyi wrote. La monnaie est trop sérieuse pour être laissée à l'initiative de banquiers privés. Nous nouveau, deuxième intuition polanienne, le régime monétaire doit être garanti du comportement opportuniste des gens privés. Troisième intérêt de Polanyi, la nature n'est pas un acteur comme les autres. Land is only another name for nature, which is not produced by man. Illusion, on peut gouverner la nature par un mécanisme de marché. Alors que s'il y a des processus irréversibles, très compliqués de réchauffement euh, climatique, le système de prix sera incapable. Il y a nouveau troisième marchandise fictive de, de Polanyi. Et vous voyez très bien que Polanyi devrait être euh, le personnage du siècle actuel, puisqu'il s'agit de réinsérer ces trois, ces trois marchandises, le travail, la monnaie et la nature, dans une société. Society's problems begin, according to Polanyi, by pretending that these commodities will behave as if they are real. Greek debt illustrates the fatal consequences. Its story begins here in Frankfurt. Most of the Greek debt is owed to German banks. Creditors will always try to get their money back. And effectively, having lent all this money, they are demanding it back. So what are they doing? They're trying to extend these loans, uh, impose more taxes, uh, impose privatizations of Greek assets in order to get the money back. 400 people have been detained in the Eurozone's financial capital after clashes broke out there on a second day of anti-austerity protests. Frankfurt Greece was offered a bailout in order to enable it to pay its creditors. More loans in exchange for austerity measures and the privatization of public assets. There was no bailout for Greeks or for the Irish or for the Portuguese. What there was, was a cynical attempt to transfer the losses from German banks onto the shoulders of German taxpayers. Seen from a Greek perspective, Northern European countries wanted to shield their banks from the devastating losses they would incur if Greece failed to pay its debt. In May 2012, we have this remarkable example of bankruptocracy European style. The Greek state borrowed from the bailout fund, which was backed, of course, by German taxpayers. Now, what happened to this money? Was it used in order to stimulate the Greek economy, in order to pay for unemployment benefits, given that unemployment, unemployment had doubled from 10 to 20 percent, and now it's 25 percent? No, not one penny went into the Greek economy in any shape or form. That money, the four billion, was used in order to repay the European Central Bank for bonds of the Greek state that it had purchased. The ECB, the European Central Bank, had purchased these bonds at a discount. But when those bonds matured in May of 2012, the European Central Bank demanded the full price, the full face value of those bonds. So Greece, had to borrow effectively from Germany in order to give to the ECB a sum of money which was effectively well above the cost to the ECB of these bonds. We have to compliment the government and therefore also the people of Greece in the perseverance of going through these difficult times and going through difficult measures that were inevitable to be taken. 
I think bailout was a fantastic marketing ploy, and it was anything but a bailout. Effectively, it is keeping the patient alive, I keeping Greece solvent um, without going for a default. Because if you, we did have a, a default, all the banks and the creditors would lose out. By giving the so-called bailout, you extend and pretend, and pretend that Greece is solvent and can pay this money back, and it allows you to buy time to try to extract as much as money back through, through taxes or through privatizations. Es ist richtig, man könnte, wenn man zynisch wäre, sogar sagen, die Banken haben den Kommunismus für sich entdeckt. Solange die Geschäfte gut gehen, machen sie Profite, große Profite, große Bonuses, alles bestens. Wenn die Geschäfte schlecht gehen oder gar ein Kollaps droht, sind sie too big to fail, zu groß, um zu scheitern. Und äh, insofern, was immer sie tun, es scheint die Sonne und es regnet Manna. Das ist, äh, könnte man ja, nicht nur zynischerweise so sagen. Insofern ähm, hat die These an der Oberfläche etwas für sich. Der Kapitalismus als Produktionsweise geht sehr viel tiefer. Das ist nicht nur, ob äh, Banken... Äh, ausgekauft werden oder nicht. Man muss es hinzufügen, was wäre die Konsequenz gewesen? Hätte ich die Banken rausgekauft, wenn ich in der Regierung gewesen wäre? Ja. Warum? Weil wir es mit einer Krise zu tun haben, die, wenn es zu einem massiven Bankenkollaps geführt hätte, und das wäre gekommen, wenn es die äh, Bailout-Pakete äh, äh, nicht gegeben hätte, also wenn es die massive staatliche Intervention mit Hunderten von Milliarden äh, Euros, Dollars, äh, Jans, Jens, wat, was auch immer, äh, wenn es das nicht gegeben hätte, hätte es einen massiven Bankenkollaps mit einem massiven Zusammenbruch der Weltwirtschaft nach sich gezogen. Diese Konsequenzen, die kann niemand wollen. Da sind wir uns hoffentlich klar. Polanyi also anticipated the havoc caused by what he called the fiction of money as a commodity. It would prove as disastrous to business as flood and drought in primitive societies, he wrote. No society could stand the effect of such a system of crude fiction. The story of the Great Transformation is the story of pushback, that society became an important protagonist. And this was novel, because for those who were involved in economics, individualism was the key. There was no society. It is, on the one hand, my father's concept of the disembedded economy, the idea that capitalism has disembedded the economic life from the social base, or rather has transformed the social base to serve the economy, so that um, economic relations uh, begin to govern, you know, the way in which we relate to each other in society. The golden era of consumption. It is so important that protecting this era has become the top priority for the materials economy. That's why after 9-11, when our country was in shock and President Bush could have suggested any number of appropriate things, to grieve, to pray, to hope. No, he said to shop, to shop. We have become a nation of consumers. In my father's perspective, it is more the other way around, that the society is the base and the economy rests in a way on on a society and when those links disappear and when it is disembedded from that society and assumes a life of its own and drives what we do and how we work and how we consume and how we think, 
we ultimately have an unsustainable system because it eats out the social relations and also the relations to the natural environment. In Greece, the place where Dimitri Christoulas shot himself has become a shrine. His funeral turned into a political demonstration. Polanyi in The Great Transformation pictured society as an irresistible force, meaning the coming of new market institutions, running up headlong against an immovable object, which was society itself. And the reason one ran into the other is because the new market economy cast a kind of a net covering everything. <laughs> What we're living through right now is just dramatized conflict between democracy and the market. My father was saying there is a problem. There is a contradiction between capitalism and democracy. In capitalism and democracy, we have become used to, uh, presented to us as complements. The two things go together. But that is, uh, on closer examination, not really the case. Not when the capitalism takes the form of this gross um, financialization and basic capture of the political process. How many meetings we've had of Merkel and Sarkozy and the governor of the European Central Bank, and they burn the midnight oil, and they come make a big decision as to how they're going to solve it. And then they go to sleep, and then they wake up to, to find out in the morning what the market has to say. Stock markets rallied this week after EU leaders reached an unexpected degree of consensus. We have whole societies with democratic institutions, you have democratically elected leaders, but they are powerless uh, in, in light of the judgment of the market. À l'observateur contemporain, il y a vraiment un paradoxe. D'où vient ce pouvoir de la finance Il vient du fait suivant. Les électeurs votent de temps en temps. Euh, tous les cinq ans pour la présidence, euh, tous les cinq ans pour le Parlement, euh, régulièrement au niveau local. Mais les marchés financiers, tous les jours, toutes les 20 secondes, évaluent le coût de refinancement de la dette publique. Je suis pas sûr que le, le, le capitalisme financier d'aujourd'hui soit forcément euh, différent de ce point de vue-là que le capitalisme industriel du 19e siècle. Ce qui est vrai, en revanche, c'est que le, le, le nouveau, disons, capitalisme financier mondialisé d'aujourd'hui contient un élément qui, là, était absolument absent euh, du 19e siècle ou même de la première mondialisation financière jusqu'en 1914, qui est un niveau d'opacité financière et d'enchevêtrement des positions de possession croisée entre pays totalement hallucinant. C'est-à-dire que euh, la structure de la propriété financière était beaucoup plus simple en 1900-1910, euh, où il y avait euh, euh, en gros beaucoup plus de détention directe de titres financiers d'un pays sur l'autre. Aujourd'hui, la situation est beaucoup plus compliquée parce qu'on a, à travers un système d'intermédiation financière beaucoup plus sophistiqué, ces jeux de détention croisée entre pays créent euh, un sentiment de dépossession 
chez les populations qui, je pense, euh, est une des parties les plus inquiétantes du, du capitalisme actuel et qui, qui n'est pas qu'un sentiment de dépossession, qui est aussi une réalité puisque chaque pays, finalement, se retrouve détenu. Enfin, les entreprises de chaque pays, l'immobilier de chaque pays, la dette publique de chaque pays est détenue à 50 ou parfois 60, 70% par d'autres pays. Alors en fait, chacun détient les autres, parfois sans s'en rendre compte.